नमः विष्णुदाय कृष्ण विष्णुदाय बुद्धले श्रीमद् भक्ति दंड स्वामी तनामिनी नमस्ते सस्वाजी वे बड़वानी पचारी ने निवसी सस्वन्यवानी पश्चत्या सचारी सी कृष्ण चितानी अप्रमुन चिनांदा श्री वेद ग्राहता श्री वेद गोवक्ते हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्णा I would like to keep it little short I thought I should talk about I talked about yesterday the other day about various things and there are so many things to say actually because by the end of the day I had quite the fortune to have some uh, a lot of association actually with Prabhupada. I mean, now I will talk about the last days that I was just packing my Sankirtan van for the next week when somebody came down from Retosov and said that you have to go to India. Prabhupada is uh, wanting, he wants that uh, somebody of his disciples should come representing every yatra. And so uh, I, I couldn't believe my ears. Uh, two days later, I was on the plane to, uh, to India, and uh, uh, I arrived in the afternoon uh, in Vrindavan. And so I came in the room, she had proper was lying there and he was, I was shocked. He was very skinny. I'd seen him before in London in spring and he was already very skinny at that time and couldn't move really, he had to be carried in a palaquin. <coughs> so uh, at that time the doctor, by the way, uh, at one stage Prabhupada all of a sudden, we were told, had to go to the hospital for some operation and there was some, some situation that he couldn't uh, pass, he couldn't uh, let the water. And so at that uh, occasion, the Indian doctor uh, in the hospital said that, Swamiji, you have to take dialysis. Dialysis is a kidney machine, at least two times a week. And Prabhupada said, I will not have that. He said, no such a thing. My spiritual master also, uh, no way. And so the doctor said, well, then you wouldn't live long. He said, you won't be able to probably make it to the end of the year. This I heard from Hare Krishna Swami, who went with him. And so when I came to uh, Vindavan, the Prabhupada was lying down there, and uh, uh, it was very shocking. He was very skinny. And uh, uh, so shortly after that, Prabhupada said somebody should sing. And uh, uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami says, can anybody sing? I said, well, I can sing. Can you play harmonium? He said, yes. So I sang for Prabhupada about maybe two hours. And then uh, to my surprise, when I was finished, Prabhupada made an indication that he wanted to rest. He said to TKG that uh, let him come back tomorrow. And so I sang next morning. He said, that means 2 o'clock. Come at 2 o'clock. So I came at 2. And uh, he said, you have to sing up to eight. That's a long time. That's six hours. I, w I don't know how I was able to do that, uh, to sing for six hours. But uh, Prabhupada lying right next to me, <laughs> four, meter, four feet, feet away, five feet away, uh, it was uh, extraordinary that I was able to do that. And the thing is, in the next day, in the evening, Prabhupada said again uh, to Tamara, and he should come back. And so I actually was asked uh, to chant uh, every one of the 21 days. It was, I sang in the morning, he left in the evening. That was quite uh, a long time with Prabhupada. And most of the time I was alone with Prabhupada in the room. He would roll over to uh, the side where I was sitting and he was squinting his eyes to see. And uh, then he was in his own world with Krishna and I would sing my heart out. After all, that was my last opportunity to do something for Prabhupada. And uh, so while I was there, uh, a lot of things uh, happened. Like one time, Prabhupada felt very uncomfortable. There was some pain. And uh, he had a dream that a doctor would come from Kakata, a Ramanuja doctor. He said, I saw in my dream the doctor had a Ramanuja tilak on his forehead, and he would heal him. And so uh, Arida, who is a temple president, and a friend of mine, actually, he came over with a doctor two days later, and it was a Ramanuja doctor, a Ramanuja Tilak, 
And the doctor examined Prabhupada, and he said, yes, uh, he needs to take Makaratvaj. Makaratvaj is a very famous Ayurvedic medicine to crank up the body when the body is very weak. Makaratvaj is given. That's the medicine number one of choice. And so the doctor, of course, didn't bring any medicines. And so uh, I would think it was Lokanath Swami or Abhiram, one of the two, because they were there. And Abhiram was always taking care of Prabhupada, was sent to get that Makaratvaj. And so uh, the Makaratvaj arrived in the evening. It was administered. And then uh, 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 the next day, a story, a uh, uh, situation evolved, which is actually has been grossly misunderstood by many devotees and misinterpreted, while it was actually a very simple story. And Prabhupada was standing beside his bed. He said, I think I've been poisoned. And I was in shock when I heard that. I ran upstairs to Adida and said, look, Prabhupada said he's poisoned. He called the doctor. The doctor was in the same room and said to the doctors this and that, and the doctor said, impossible. He said, I examined him yesterday. There was nothing such a thing. Let's go. And so he examined Prabhupada, and he said yes. He said, this Makaratvaj, there's a homeopathic amount of uh, arsenic acid in many medicines, Ayurvedic medicines, but it's homeopathic, a very small, tiny percentage, milligram, microgram or something. He said, it's overdone. The proportions are wrong. And we have to set it up and we have to stop immediately. So then Prabhupada, in the next four or five days, as long as he lived, he never complained. So it's a, it's a very simple story, actually, what's happened there. And uh, uh, as people have no knowledge what actually happened there, there is this enormous swirl of speculative ideas descended upon Iskon and uh, is. Uh, uh, published on the on the uh, on the social media, while there's absolutely no substance in it, and you can read this uh, same report, identical report, you see in in uh, um, in uh, the book of Sats of uh, uh, who was it Bhakti Charu Swami. He said the same thing, and Giriraj Goswami also maintains exactly the same story. We have three people who were there. And we come to the same conclusion. There's no question of any kind of uh, foul play. And I was asked also, and I, I'm sorry if I bring this up, but I think it is a good opportunity, actually. Uh, uh, one German criminologist asked me, what is the motive if somebody is lying on his deathbed? Why should somebody poison him? What's, what's the, who's benefited from that? And so it becomes very clear. If you hear the story, a very simple story, but if it, this uh, human art to speculate is endless, endless. And uh, so many disturbing reports went out over the years. There's absolutely no substance in it. It's very simple. It's a simple story. But uh, those who were not there, they speculate. So it could be this, it could be that, it could be that. And so uh, uh, there's nothing to it. And so this may be also uh, satisfying for you to hear. There's absolutely nothing to it. It's just a story. <clears throat> and people like to make up stories. The whole world is full of mental speculation. And uh, as Krishna said, Yashastami, Yusijavatate Kama Kama Karata, one who bases his life on mental speculation, Nasasi Dimabhapnati. He cannot achieve perfection, Nasuka, no happiness, no Paramgatim, no can he achieve the supreme destination. It's right in Shastra. <clears throat> so then times went by, and uh, uh, it came to the point that Prabhupada became weaker and weaker, and it became clear, the doctor told us, it is a matter of hours. And so uh, on the second last day, Prabhupada uh, wanted medicine. And it was Bhakti Sri Swami who gave him medicine, because Prabhupada liked to take uh, a medicine from Bhakti Sri Swami. There was a very close personal relationship to him, because they, from Bengali to Bengali, I mean, it always has been. We were surprised that Bhakti Sri Swami uh, was initiated so fast. First initiation, second initiation, then sannyas. It was such a surprise. And so one of my godbrothers actually said, Srila Prabhupada, how come I have to wait for this for three years to take sannyas or four years? And Prabhupada mm -hmm. smiled and said, because he was more advanced when he was born than you now. <laughs> Prabhupada was very cutting. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so this has happened. Then he had to give him medicine. And uh, uh, Prabhupada asked a very simple question. Did he close the medicine, the, the, the bottle? Because Prabhupada was a medical man before. And he would take a, a pill out of, 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 the, of the thing, put it on a little tablet or whatever, a little tray, and would close the bottle because otherwise you put the open bottle there and knock it over. So he was, every time he was closing the bottle. And he said, did you close the bottle? He said, I forgot Prabhupada. He said, that is your disease. He said, all of you, all of you. And then he said, you know how to open bottles. You don't know how to close them. You know how to open bottles, but you don't know how to close them. You start so many new things. You start so many new things, and you don't see the consequences. It was a classical example of the state of the world. If you look at the environment, for example, oceans are polluted, rivers are polluted, mountains are destroyed, uh, water is destroyed, food is destroyed, our bodies are destroyed, the air is destroyed. What, what is it? Opening bottles. Opening bottles, opening scientists. It has turned the world into a hellhole by opening bottles. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know the long range consequences. They don't think about that. It may help right away the medicine, but what about the long range, long range consequences? And that's what Prabhupada extracted out of such a little thing. You know, <laughs> that somebody forgot to open, close, close the bottle. He said, that's the disease. You, all of you. Then we open the bottle, we start new things, we don't see the consequences. And then he said, you know how to live. He said, but you don't know how to die. And therefore, I have to show you. And so then a little later, Yaduba was called, and he made this film based on Prabhupada's instruction, namely the final lesson. Who has seen this film, the final lesson? Yeah, and this is the sequence, how this developed, why this film was made. Prabhupada said that, you know, and I have to show you. And so, as far as that is concerned, Prabhupada's last hours, one of the last things he said is just that, that you know how to open bottles. Then he was already uh, uh, struggling with air. He was, he made this sound which is described in Vedic scriptures as Guru Guru. The <laughs> mucus in the throat. Has anybody of you seen somebody die, right? Once you have seen that, you know when it's coming. Next, next time you see it, you know exactly it's on the way, you know? So it was on the way. And so in the middle of this struggle uh, with mucus, all of a sudden he lifted his hand very peacefully. I mean, I have a little tremble in my hand, he had nothing in his hand. You know, the hand was completely free from any kind of trembling. And he said, and this take took about maybe two, three minutes, five minutes to say that, he said, uh, everything moving and non-moving. These are the last words of Prabhupada on the planet. On the planet, everything moving and non-moving, there's nothing but Krishna. So this consciousness is called Krishna consciousness. That was his last message, practice speaking. Awesome. And in that situation, facing death, he showed his Krishna consciousness. I said, oh, sorry, everything moving, non-moving, it's nothing but Krishna consciousness. Krishna is nothing but Krishna. This consciousness is called Krishna consciousness. That was the last sentence. So you see, even in this difficult situation of leaving the body, Prabhupada was completely dearer, completely undisturbed. <laughs> and so a few later, minutes later, he said, Hare, Hare Krishna. And he didn't come to the Nara, he was already gone. <coughs> And then it's tremendous care. We all, 50 people in the room, 40 people in the room, I forgot, a lot of people in the room, the windows were open, people from outside crowded into the window. And then a tremendous kirtan broke out. Tremendous kirtan, chanting Hare Krishna mantra, that Prabhupada always liked that normal Hare Krishna. And uh, it went on for a good while. And people were crying and embracing each other. Uh, I was crying, I said, right, Veta Maharaj crying, and so many people were crying. Because it was such a heartbreak for all of us that here is our guru, he left us. And we were, we were left alone in the material world. And so then, uh, what happened next? The next morning, there was a, a, a procession to all the temples, and I happened to be in the room again. <clears throat> and so Tamal asked me to help, to put Prabhupada's a body into a seat. 
And uh, what I've seen, he had no rigor mortis. I mean, you could take his hand and shake like this. There was no rigor mortis there, which is a sign of a great, score, a great soul. And Gaudiya tradition is considered a scandal if somebody doesn't have of that status, if he doesn't have, if he has rigor mortis, it's considered to be a, scan a scandal, actually. So his hands were like this, and so his, uh, his jaw was down, as it was the last moment. Hare Krishna! The, the jaw stayed there. And so Tama said to me, what do we do about it? I said, well, the best thing, we take a gum shine. We had this red gum shine and put a gum shine around his head. Yeah. Tama had the, skin, the, the, the gold draw up and put the gamsha, and then on top Tama placed Prabhupada's uh, uh, hat, the Swami hat, and he was tied to the back of the, the asana. And you can see this on the, on the films when people carry the palaquin. You see there's a red gamsha there going around his neck like this, and then there was this Swami hat. And so we came, uh, we went to all the temples, and uh, it was uh, wonderful. People came out with their tr Arctic trained, offered uh, respect wherever we went. It was amazing. I've never seen that before. And so we went from temple to temple. So every temple, uh, a keeper, a group of people came out and performed some sort of a puja for Prabhupada. And so finally we arrived back in, in Vrindavan. When we are in, uh, in our ashram, and when we arrived, a pit has been uh, uh, digged quite deep, maybe, well, it was deep, it was maybe two meters at least, if not three. There was, a, as far as I remember, there was a marble plate down there, and the body of Prabhupada was, was uh, handed down, and of course his legs fell out of the lotus position and were dangling, it was not a pretty picture actually, but it showed that he had no rigor mortis, and he was put into samadhi, and then there were various kinds of ceremonies, put, ceremonies performed, and it was very heartbreaking for all of us, this, and very sobering. Uh, and also on the other side, uh, I at least felt very fortunate that I could be there. And so then uh, they surrounded Prabhupada with large amount of salt. I mean, the pit was, say, at least three, three meters or two meters fifty by two meters fifty. Uh, quite big space, and it filled, filled, filled with there was salt there, then Prabhupada, and salt, 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 salt. And uh, the reason is that no worm and no rat or no mouse can, is able to go through a wall of salt. It's not possible. <laughs> not even warm. Huh? Why are you telling all the details? What? Did... Details, no details. <laughs> what was that? No details, please. Well, I, I just wanted to say this to you. This was very detailed to your lecture, extremely detailed. So let me do the my nice thing. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so in any case, it was a block of salt, and ultimately they put a stick, a bamboo rod on Prabhupada's head, and, uh, and uh, uh, so when the earth reached the surface, somebody put a stick, uh, a little mound around the stick, pulled the stick out, there was a hole, fell in and that was Prabhupada's marker, so that people knew exactly where the body was situated. And when you go now into the Samadhi in Vrindavan, you know Prabhupada is not lying here in Samadhi, sitting here in Samadhi, he sits directly under the, the murti of Srila Prabhupada. And so, uh, well, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, uh, there's quite other things I could say, but let's leave it with that. And, uh, well, all we can say is Srila uh, Prabhupada Ki Jai. We are very fortunate that we could be here. We are grateful to His Divine Grace. Some other, we are here since a long time. And uh, there's no plans to change that plan and uh, just keep on going till uh, uh, finally nobody of us will be around. It's just a matter of a couple of years. She's a proud part of the keys, I should have proud part of the keys, I go for another. Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pestaya Bhutale, Shima De Bhaktivedanta Swami Nitinamene, Namaste Saraswati Devam Gauravani Padarene, Nirvisesa Sonyavari, Pastatya De Satarni. So um, uh, I thought about 
telling the story of how I joined Krishna consciousness, which is kind of funny, and how also how I arrived in the Swedish Yatra. I want to start with my great-grandfather. <laughs> Uh, my great-grandfather emigrated from Sweden, so our family surname is Pettersson. My na given name is Erland Pettersson. And uh, actually, my father once was offered a post in Stockholm in the, for, as a representative of the German railways, but he didn't take it. So anyway, so this is maybe the reason why I came to Sweden. <coughs> But first of all, how did I meet Sheila Baupart first? Uh, the first time I met Sheila Baupart was in 1972 in uh, Paris, France. And uh, maybe you know my, some of you know my younger brother, His Holiness Sachinandan Swami. He joined the movement in 1971. And uh, while I was still at the military, and I kept visiting the Hamburg temple to see, look after my younger brother, and also I, I felt attracted to the philosophy and to the prasadam. And uh, <clears throat> after finishing the military, uh, my plan of life was to travel around the world first for about a year, uh, maybe to Morocco and go traveling and see what I wanted to do in life. Um, and um, so I, I, I set out to hitchhike, uh, car, stopping cars and hitchhiking, at the exit to the auto, from the autobahn uh, to, to, to the autobahn from Hamburg south. And uh, the first car that stopped was a big VW van, all painted with the Vicunta planets. There was. Uh, I had known the devotees before, so there was one devotee artist, Vasudeva Prabhu, and he had painted the VW bus with the uh, 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 jacket of the first Kanto Srimad Bhagavatam, so all these Vaikuntha planets. <clears throat> so that was the first car that stopped. And there were the Hamburg devotees in there, and they were going all the way to Paris. And I thought, well, that's a good stretch to go to Paris in, in uh, one afternoon. So they took me in the car. And uh, in the car, already, I started translating a booklet from English to German. And then stayed with the devotees until Srila Prabhupada's arrival. And I just loved this devotee environment. They were young like me. They were all interested in self-realization and things from India. And uh, they were like, had this light, hippie mood, I found, so we were good friends. And we all prepared the hall for Srila Prabhupada's visit. A lot of cleaning had to be done. Uh, I had, had brought my camera, uh, photos had to be taken, and so many, so many preparations had to be made for Srila Prabhupada's visit, which I really enjoyed doing because of the enthusiastic, enthusiastic mood of the devotees. And then the first time I met Sheila Baupart was when we all picked him up at the Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport. And I must say that my first sight of Sheila Baupart created the strongest impression in me that I ever had of him. Uh, the, we have this book, it is displayed there. There's one chapter, it's called The Paris Sunrise because I wasn't the only one who felt like that when we first met Srila Prabhupada. Let me describe that scene. So um, Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport was a large airport even at that time. And when Prabhupada's plane arrived, all these business people uh, left the plane and went into the immigration. The procedure was a little bit different from today. They had to go passport checking to the immigration. So Baupart was standing in line with all these people waiting to get into France. And we spotted Sheila Baupart there because he had this bright orange uh, dodi on. He was all dressed in saffron dodi, and everybody else was dressed in business suits, gray, black, like that. And uh, so Baupart stood out through his robes through his dress, but not only through his dress, but also through his face and his entire demeanor. 
Uh, Prabhupada wasn't big at all. He was one meter sixty high. But uh, when he looked at the, his, his devotees, he had this, uh, what they later called, oceanic smile. So he was beaming out of joy to see the devotees, and he was waving towards the devotees. Nobody else had that face when arriving at the airport. So Srila Prabhupada looked so happy, and we all felt so ecstatic when seeing Srila Prabhupada like that, now how he was looking at us, how he was so happy to meet his young disciples there at the airport. And uh, that is described in this book as the Paris sunrise. It really felt as if the sun was rising. So that was my first impression uh, of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, then um, there was this festival in Paris going on, a three-day festival, and uh, Prabhupada would give the Bhagavatam lectures daily and all three, about three lectures per day, I think I remember, and there were kirtans given by Srila Prabhupada and also by Bhagavan Das. So these kirtans for me were so ecstatic. I was a young man, I was 20, and I felt like leaping about a meter high and jumping and dancing. These kirtans were just fantastic in the presence of Srila Prabhupada. And then, uh, uh, since the devotees explained to me that Srila Prabhupada is a pure devotee, I observed him very closely. Uh, I observed him walking. You know, seeing Srila Prabhupada walking was an experience. I, my uh, subjective impression was that he, when he walked, he didn't touch the floor. He was kind of hovering 10 centimeters above the floor. That, that was my subjective impression. He had a very flowing gait. He, when he walked, he was kind of flowing. Then he was already in 1972, uh, uh, he was already uh, 76 years old, right? Am I right? 76 years old. And he was like Yoginda. Yoginda is only 73. <laughs> um, when, he, when he walked up, uh, ascended the Vyasa San, he also didn't seem to climb, but he seemed to hover. He just kind of uh, uh, hovered on top of the Vyasa San in a very flowing way, and then sat down to give his class. Maybe questions at the end. Yes, at the end. Otherwise, he never finished. <laughs> uh, Okay, so that was my impression. Then also, uh, I had always been looking for saints. I was kind of a religious young man. I was interested in religion, even in school. And I had admired the saints of the past centuries, uh, how, they, how they meditated on God. But I was very sad that at that time, there don't, didn't seem to be any saints available at least for us uh, uh, Protestants in north, northern Germany, um, Lutheran Protestants, no saints at present. So I found that kind of sad, and nobody to approach. But, and I had also seen pictures of saints, and they're always depicted with a halo around the head. You have seen this? The halo around the head. So Srila Prabhupada, I must tell you, he didn't have a halo only around his head. He had a halo around his entire body. You know, he was just like, like, like beaming. His entire body was beaming. That was, this wasn't only observed by me, but there are also other devotees who saw Srila Prabhupada. There's a story of a policeman who's turned around. Uh, this, this gentleman is beaming, he's glowing, something wrong, maybe we have to call the fire brigade or something. <laughs> uh, but to me, Srila Prabhupada had his halo around his entire body. So I was very fascinated. Uh, also, there were a few darshans with Srila Prabhupada. I couldn't understand his lectures so well because I, my English was not so good and Prabhupada had this accent. But during the darshan, he looked at me, and I found that very elevating. And then uh, the Hamburg temple president, Chakravati Prabhu, um, uh, he came to me and said, uh, uh, Bhakta Erland, Erland uh, Prabhupada is going to give initiation day after tomorrow. And I've talked to Prabhupada. He would initiate you as his disciple. So I had only been with the devotees for three days. <laughs> yeah, I had 
Before the festival, they told me Baupad is coming, such a great person, so we all have to look properly, and I had agreed to have my head shaven. Uh, my head was shaven, and Chakravali said, now, next day, you can become initiated. And um, uh, looking back, I would have liked to take that opportunity, but my mind crept in. He said, Erland, it's too early. You still have your hashish chillum in your backpack. Huh? And you still have those thousand marks in your backpack. And didn't you want to travel around the world? So you can't get initiated now and stay with this, these people. So I was becoming kind of critical about my own enthusiasm. And um, well, mm, from Paris, the devotees went on to Amsterdam. He said, well, well that's a good start of my a trip around the world, first go to Paris, then from Paris to Amsterdam. And the Amsterdam, some have already told the story, there was the installation of Lord Jagannath, Baladev, and Subhadra. And simultaneously, there was the uh, sannyas uh, initiation of uh, Akurya Nanda Swami, who also was the temple president and the main manager of the entire program, the installation program. So it all had become a little much for him, and uh, the uh, Amsterdam installation was a big mess. There is a chapter in this book also, the Amsterdam Mass. Yes, please? Uh, that was Britannienstraat, so, right? Britannienstraat, yes, yes. So um, I, I was doubting, you, you can't become that enthusiastic so soon, and uh, so I was, Sitting there in the temple room, the temple room was, uh, I think from here to there, not as big as this one. And I was leaning against the wall, uh, pulling up my knees, uh, and uh, looking at the entire installation ceremony. And even for me, as a new person, it was obvious that something wasn't right there. It wasn't. It wasn't correct. You know, there were some mistakes. Especially, I observed Srila Prabhupada, and he sat his, on his Vyasasan, and he had an angry face. And he was criticizing, this is not right, this is not right. You are chanting the mantras wrong. What is this? What is this? It's, Prabhupada wasn't satisfied. Then the altar was, was too small, it, it, it threatened to collapse, and it was a whole thing. I thought, aha. I looked at Prabhupada, he was angry, and I said, I had read about saints, and saints never become angry. Huh? We describe as always happy, never disturbed. But here I see Srila Prabhupada being angry. And I thought, maybe he's not a yogi after all, because huh? he's uh, uh, <laughs> manifesting this type of anger. So I was sitting there, leaning back, uh huh, uh huh. And while I thought that, Prabhupada turned around to me. I was sitting about 10 meters, or 15 meters away from, turned around to me, looked at me and said, it is an offense to sit before the deities like this. Leaning against the wall and pulling me up. Sit properly, he told me. And I immediately shrugged and sat, sat up very properly and I mean, I could have left the room because, first of all, I, my mind tells me this is uh, not a self-realized person. Then he scolds me, so I could have just, No, but I actually followed his instruction. First time I followed Srila Prabhupada's instruction, I did sit properly. And uh, so from that time on, actually, then I uh, traveled to Germany with the devotees. It was in Heidelberg and Hamburg and so on and so forth. Um, about two years I stayed in, mostly in the temple. I did translation work from English to German. And we went out for a book magazine distribution once in a while in Hamburg. And then uh, we were told, now go on traveling Sanketan. You wanted to say something? So how did you get rid of this? feeling of Prabhupada that you continue serving? Yeah, I thought, he's reading my mind, so he probably is a yogi, I thought. He's reading my mind, so I thought he is a, is a yogi. 
And so I stayed with the devotees. And uh, then we started uh, first book distribution parties in Germany and with the VW bus. And um, later, <clears throat> when the castle was bought, Schloss Rettershof, I was sent to Denmark with Narendra Prabhu. He listened to Vegavans and Artit's presentation in the beginning. Narendra also went to Stockholm in the beginning. Uh, then went back to Germany, and then uh, I was sent to Den to Copenhagen with Narendra. And we had a van full of books, and we drove to Flensburg, but the customs stopped us at the border. We couldn't enter Denmark because it was too many books, and we would have had to pay customs. So we drove back to Hamburg, and then Narendra and me packed up suitcases with books. We took the train, the suitcase full of books. He took one suitcase, really heavy, 25 kJs. And I had one suitcase like that. And then uh, uh, we found a place in what we call Christiania, uh, in a shack. We stayed, but it was summertime. There was one wall missing, hippie camp. You know Christiania in, in Kirvenau? Hippie camp, uh, and uh, there we started preaching. Christ, Christia, yeah, Christiania in German, I think in, even in Danish, Christiania, right, Christian, Christian's Haun. You, you know the place? Yeah, I just heard uh, that they closed it down just recently, but it, it, <laughs> decades. So there uh, we, we started Sankirtan and gradually it developed, became uh, more, um, Bak uh, His Holiness Bhakti Bhushan Swami was temple president for some time. And we started with only books. Uh, and at the time we uh, distributed those books, I read Chaitanya Chaitam Rita Adi Lila's chapter 7, and especially the part where it says that the Pancha Tattva, they broke open, open the storehouse of love and God of Godhead and distributed that love of God uh, without discrimination to just anybody, if qualified or not qualified. And this was our mood. You know, This was the mood when we went out distributing books. So uh, more books, more and more books came from Germany. And uh, uh, book distribution at that time was, I must openly say, it was not allowed. It did just, it was, you just couldn't get a permission for walking around in the street with a bag and approaching people to uh, take your book or your your product. That was just not there. Uh, especially we were foreigners. We didn't know so well the uh, um, laws, Danish laws. But we did actually ask and said, yeah, yeah, it would be possible you, you stay at a little corner in the street. And then uh, you have your products and you may wave uh, people, so I asked them to come and look at your products. But this was not Prabhupada's mood. Prabhupada's mood was to flood the entire country with his books, you know. Books are the basis, you know, then. So uh, we, we just couldn't do that. So we just went out anyway. We approached people, distributed so many books. The yoga library, yoga bibliotheque, for example, along with other things also. And in this way, uh, for three years, I was on the traveling Sankirtan party with uh, Krishna Kshetra, a Swami, at that time, Krishna Kshetra Das, and with many others, Jaigora Das, and many others, uh, even with Smita Krishna Swami also. And uh, we went to every town and village in all of Denmark to distribute uh, knowledge about Srila Prabhupada uh, without permission. And after three years, we were sent out because we were doing, I was the party leader at that time, we were doing houses and uh, some person complained or asked, do they have a permit to offer their products? And the police didn't have anything like that. So uh, I was uh, arrested by the police car. I still remember how the police car came and slowly, ah, there he is. And, Come on, sir, yeah, please get in. 
They drove me to the uh, police station. The entire rest of the party was there at the police station already. And uh, we spent three days in, in jail in Fordingborg. And there was a, during which we all stayed in one cell only. We, we requested the police to please let us stay in one uh, jail cell so we could do our programs together. Uh, we had 10 to 25 rounds a day, and we had three programs every day. Bhagavatam class, uh, then Nectar of Devotion class at noon, and Bhagavad Gita class in the evening. It was so ecstatic. Uh, we took shower from the sink only, and but it was quite ecstatic. Then the court case came, and they asked us, well, where do they send the money? We, we all said, you know, they, they cross-interviewed us, you know, cross-interrogation, it's quite heavy. Two po one policeman there, one policeman there, so it was quite heavy. And uh, one of us, he, he became afraid, I won't mention his name, but he said that just the year before, in Schloss Rettershof, the same thing had happened, and the police raided the castle, Schloss Rettershof, and all the money was confiscated. And then the Danish police called the German police, and we've got the same people here. And then the, the result of the court case was, you have to leave Denmark for three years, you're not allowed to, to return to Denmark. So we all went back to Germany, to Schloss Wettershof, did book distribution in Germany, um, and then uh, Vega Wan and Arjit heard about uh, yeah, about me, uh, because I'd already talked, had talked to them when they passed by in Heidelberg, Germany, and they said, oh, these people are good, you know. <laughs> they could do some book distribution in Sweden, and then they requested me to come and uh, join their Sankatan. We did the same thing that we had done in Denmark, without permit or anything. And once in a while, we were taken in by the police, but there were never any consequences in Sweden. They let us go, just leave, go to the next city. And um, so we were happily distributing Schiller Braunfart's books all over Sweden. And I must really emphasize that this book distribution is the basis of the Krishna consciousness movement. Uh, we felt like Schiller Braunfart soldiers. It was a little austere. Um, but we were giving out Srila Prabhupada's knowledge, Srila Prabhupada's books, and we also did some records with Srila Prabhupada singing. And uh, you can't imagine how many books were distributed in Sweden over the years. Uh, I asked Brahma Muhorta, for example, about the statistics, how many books were distributed in Germany. He didn't know. He didn't know that some of the records got lost. Uh, I, maybe for Sweden, the records are still there, but we distributed hundreds of thousands and millions of Schiller Baupart's books over so, over so many years. And this book distribution is really the foundation of our movement. Meanwhile, it is not illegal anymore. Now, I don't know so well about Sweden, but in Germany, every Sankirtan devotee has a permit. You know, he has uh, documents to show. We get to permits by each and every city. These devotees go on seminars, book distribution seminars. They are uh, taught what to say and what not to say. And uh, the Harinam parties are all legal. Huh? It's all, all established. Uh, I think it's like, like that in Sweden, too. I'm not sure. I'm not so informed, so I won't speak about it. But really, uh, the movement of our success is in Srila Prabhupada's books. Huh? Now you can see over the years, we, ISKCON is already uh, over 50 years old, and uh, it's an established society. Now we got Erasmus funds. Uh, in Sweden, you got young people, they are sent by the EU, they are sent to Einweg Squad, you, give, you have educational programs with them. Same thing in Germany, at Goloka Dam also, they get e these Erasmus groups and Samhachalam Temple. The devotees teaching them Ridanga and the EU uh, um, supports that and they, they learn the philosophy is all 
accepted as official educational programs. They learn about agriculture. Here they learn about uh, foresting. Yogin Prabhu, uh, uh, he gave a seminar about wood processing, wood processing. And uh, we are an official society, but it all started with these Sankirtan devotees who passed out that many books of Srila Prabhupada. That's my conviction. And uh, still, uh, book distribution is one of the major uh, um, activities of our International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So I distributed books in uh, Sweden for four years. Uh, after those three years had expired that we weren't allowed in, into Denmark, we went back in with Smita Krishna Swami. Uh, Smita Krishna Swami, is he here? Smita Krishna Swami and two other devotees. We went back to Denmark, same thing, distributing Prabhupada's books and some other things in the shops, in the streets, everywhere. With the same activity that we had been expelled for three years ago. So at that time, nothing happened. I remember I once ended up in the police station. They had me in the record, Alan Patterson. Aha, uh -huh. weren't you sent out of the country three years ago? Yes, I was, but that's over, isn't it? <laughs> okay, just go to the next city. Go away, go away. So we did go to the next city happily. And uh, now also book distribution is legal, legal in Denmark and uh, they have a beautiful, very stable center there in Copenhagen. Before they had a center in Bauneholm, I think, in Denmark. And uh, so there's a lot of struggle. Srila Bhagavad once said, we um, spill gallons of blood just to make one devotee. And this is how I felt we were as Prabhupada's Sankirtan soldiers. Huh? So much work, so much book distribution. We invested so much energy, uh, and again and again, books again, and we wouldn't, wouldn't uh, stop doing it, you know. So then, you know, now it's a stable thing. So I'm, whenever coming back here to Stockholm, I especially feel very happy in the presence of Sri Sri Gandavika Giridari, who were at the time there at, uh, in the 70s already when I was a Brahmachari. And uh, also, as I said, my great grandfather was Swedish. <laughs> so there is some inclination to the northern countries. Yeah. Thank you very much. There is a Gora Arti at seven. Yeah. Only a few. Eight minutes left. Do you, somebody wanted to say something? Yeah. Oh, Rimati wanted to say something. Uh, about Srila Prabhupada, you're uh, explaining how he's like floating. And, floating, yes. Yeah, floating. Um, there was actually, um, I guess it was in the Uppsala University uh, where we were waiting for Srila Prabhupada. And uh, Hans Duda was leading the Kirtan. He was, uh, the Vyasa san was in the middle. Yeah. On one side was Avinash Chandra and Hansi Dutta, then Krishna Premi and myself, we were on the other side singing in the microphone. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then suddenly Srila Prabhupada came from the far end. You know, the little door opened and then he came. And uh, Hansi Dutta said, the Panam players, you know, Jaya Om Vishnu Pad Pama. And I mean, I heard this before that when Srila Prabhupada, when we would see Srila Prabhupada, we just, you know, like a rod on the floor. Mm. We just fall down and pay our businesses. So that's what we did. And I was up there on the stage. So I stretched out my whole body and two hands on the floor and done the butts. So then uh, Srila Prabhupada came on the uh, stage to go on to the Vyasa Sun, mm. but my hands were there. Mm. So, uh, and Srila Prabhupada, he stepped on my hands, mm. both of my hands, and uh, they were so soft mm -hmm. and so like no weight. Mm -hmm. 
And it was incredible, you know, it's like an electric shock goes through my whole body. Mm. And uh, so the devotee the giving the garland to Srila Prabhupada also stepped on my hands. Uh, Pitu Prabhu. <laughs> but it was painful. That, anyways. Well, I just want to say something really quickly about um, <clears throat> when you were talking about that you got locked up for three days. Yeah. I just wanted to, to tell you when we were in um, <clears throat> in uh, Melbourne, and we we got locked up too a number of times. They locked us up, but only for an afternoon usually because <clears throat> we'd have the women in one cell, the men in the other cell, mm. and we'd just be chanting Hare Krishna to the top of our lungs, oh. like reciprocating, like that first men, first women. <laughs> We just kept on chanting and chanting, and after a while, they just thought, "Oh, we got to let them out of here." <laughs> it was all too much, you know. We 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 were probably only there for, I don't know, Jeet, were you? Um, do you remember how long we were there? Uh, yeah, uh, probably only for two three hours max. But the whole time, we just chanted really intently, so it was really really beautiful. Jai, Srila Prabhupada, ki jai. Uh, Atmavidya, you want to tell the story when we went, were taken away from by the police and born? Uh, yeah, not now. I think the Lord is on a little break. Before <laughs> yeah. And I will have my talk later on. Okay, you can talk about the police. Anyways. <laughs> uh, I heard a, a saying, there's a saying that the uh, Police in the hellish planets, they are German. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are times when you spend half day in Sankatan, half day at the cock shop. <laughs> that was normal for us. <laughs> so, uh, next program, Gora Ati, correct? Gora Premananda. Hari Hari Bol, all glory to Srila Bhagavad, all glory is to book this devotion and Namaste, Saraswati Devi Gurumani Pacharine, Nirvishesha Sunyavari Pashtatyari Shatarine. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you, especially my God brothers. Um, I have very little association with God brothers. In the part of the world where I'm working, I mean, doing my service, there's hardly any association with God Brothers. So naturally, when, when you don't have that association so much, so frequently, when you come into the association of your God Brothers, you uh, feel very humble, very insignificant, especially by hearing of their activities, grandiose activities. Um, Anyway, so I'm preaching also in the third world, which doesn't have that much technical uh, advancement like you have here. Everything is very nicely established. Uh, all ultimate technology and all that. No? Anyway, so I'm glad to be here and to learn from you all. Um, so uh, well, the, the discourses or the the speeches that my God brothers gave uh, were very varied. Many of them were telling everybody how they, uh, how they, they, how they came to Krishna consciousness and all this. And uh, well, my insignificant coming to Krishna consciousness uh, was like this. Actually, um, I was also a searcher. I read many books about all kinds of philosophies. And I came to the end to go to India and, and find a guru. I was already, I mean, collecting the money for the ticket uh, when I came in touch with the devotees. The first devotee I saw was at the beginning of the Reeperbahn. I mean, Reeperbahn is a nightclub area in Hamburg, a very big nightclub area. And Shivananda was sitting there on a straw mat with a pair of cartas and a little, how you say, uh, what is that in English? Canasta. Oh, right. yeah, actually, I must say, I'm not used to speak English anymore. My language has been for years now Spanish. 
the, the, the reason I was sent to South America was that I grew up in, in South America, and uh, so I spoke Spanish. So when Harry Cage noted that, uh, and he had become a GBC in South America, in Argentina, uh, he sent me there. So anyway, uh, so when I, uh, when I saw Shivananda chanting, and he was not dressed in, in devotional clothes, he was just sitting there in ordinary clothes, and it was his eyes closed very intensely chanting, I was impressed. And not only that, actually, uh, I, I felt, when I, when I saw that and heard that, I felt that this was something familiar. But I couldn't I, I figure out where, where this was familiar from. So then I saw him and I continued my way to Queensland. You know, Queensland was at that time in Hamburg, the center of the music and everything, LSD and... And so you know, all these things, you know, hippie life. <laughs> so then uh, uh, later on, I mean, I, I that a time before I became, I used to always live in communes, uh, no, young people. I lived in several different communes, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, Bhakti Babav Marsh, at one point was also living in the same commune at that time. Anyway, so one day, and we had an altar on the, in, the, in the commune where everyone put something that was sacred to him, you know, pictures of this and that and like that. Anyway, so one day, oh, and one day I came to the Greenspan and there was an advertisement for the temple. They had put a little picture of Krishna and like strings like this, you know, like effulgence. And there was an invitation to the to the temple, and everyone at that po at that time thought this was a restaurant because there was a lot of lot of text about eating and this and that. Anyway, so one day uh, in our commune appeared a devotee. I mean, not a, he was not full devotee, but actually he came from a German family, immigrant family in America, in California, and uh, he came to the temple and went power part heard that he spoke German, he came from German descendants, immediately sent him to Germany to help translate the books and everything. Anyway, so this devotee, when he came to Hamburg, he had some, apparently had some trouble. They kind of threw him out, and so he ended in our commune. So then uh, he was a very special person. I mean, he had long hair with, with a typical thing like that, and a, flou a flute even in his, in his belt. <laughs> And sandals, you know, kind of. So anyway, so when he moved in, he started chanting Hare Krishna and cooking for us. And he was a very impressive person because he, he was very, how you say, very sober. And he did, didn't mix with the girls like we used to. And so uh, at, one, at one point, he took us to the temple. And so there was an Abendorfer Weg, you know, the first temple in Germany. And uh, so we came late to the Sunday feast. And so they were already eating. You know? This was my first impression. You know? How much these devotees were eating. They had plates loaded with so much basado. And it was so incredible, this food. You know? At that time, there was no pizza and all this stuff, all these modern additions. Actually, we were only cooking what Parvat had taught the devotees. I uh, know, like simply wonderful, halava. You know? I remember when we went to London in six, uh, in, in 70, no, in 76, yeah, 76. And power, no, 77 in September, when power had come to last time to London. And I remember Tamar Krishna, uh, this was a Vyasa Puja also, Shri Dhamma and Tamar Krishna was uh, uh, speaking about the whole life of Siddha Prabhupada. Sometimes Prabhupada stopped him and added something or corrected something. And in the end, I remember Tama said, uh, so if we would have known what was behind, what was I say, uh, behind the first plate of halawa, maybe we wouldn't, we wouldn't have taken it. <laughs> you know, like she was also glorifying halawa. You know? That's why I say so many devotees became devotees because of the halibut. <laughs> anyway, so 
when, uh, when we went there, so we didn't hear, any, hear anything. There was no ketan anymore. It just was eating. So then uh, I liked the pasadam so much that I started going to the temple at midday to eat. Mm -hmm. And so after a while, the devotee said, well, you come in and eat every day, and can you help with something? And at that time, I never had money. So anyway, so I offered to help. And the first thing they taught me was making chapatis. You know? And I became so inspired right, by this making chapatis. It was so incredible. You know? And anyway, so I, I used to come to the temple, this and that. And, uh, but I was still living, how you say, in the commune. And one, at one point, I went to, the, uh, to this uh, 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 sector. I went to Grinspan, to that restaurant, no restaurant or club. And the devotees were sitting in front of the entry of this, you know, in the middle of, of San Pauli, you know, in front of the, in front of the Grinspan. And uh, I saw the devotees, and, and, and tried to hide myself, you know, so they wouldn't see that I'm there, you know. Then Shivananda checked me, he, he, you know, and he called me. You know? And then he had to, I had to sit, I sat with him in front of the Grinch bar. And then he also, he made me chant also. You know? And then he said something that impressed me very much. He said, the lotus of your devotion in your heart is growing. <laughs> anyway, so then uh, I, I continued going to the temple. But then I felt, uh, well, I don't want to leave my independence, give up my independence. So I uh, went with two friends. We went to Christiania uh, in Copenhagen. Christiania at that time was the hem mecca of the hippies you know, from all over the world. I used to live there. And I had gotten, I purchased a pair of cartas before I went there. So I started chanting in Christiania. But after a while, I felt, well, these people, there were also a lot of alcoholics and all this, not, not just uh, seekers. Anyway, so then uh, 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 I went back. You know? I also felt, well, devotees are the best association, so I returned to Hamburg. Uh, so when I opened the, we had, you know, in Hamburg, the Eppendorfer Weg, there was a little storefront, very small, small place, shop. And the devotees had actually, they have, didn't have even their own bathroom, nothing. They were sharing. It was an old building. So the, the, the people would share the bathroom in the, in the intersection of the, of the, how do you say, the Stockwerke. What is that in Deutsch? Uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so, and also every now and then, we didn't take showers at that time. We went you know, every few days, so we went to the bathhouse and take a shower. You know? Anyway, so, uh, so then I came, and Shivananda was there, you know? and Shivananda said, Wow, there you are. We were waiting for you. you know? Wow, no, I became completely overtaken by his, how do you say, kindness. So then I said, yes, I, but I need my own room. There's one condition. And they had no room. You know? But they had befriended the lady, the, the, the owner of the shop. And she was very old, almost blind. You know? She was just happy to have young people living there who, had, who could help her every now and then. But she, couldn't, she didn't see Dodies or anything there because she was half blind. You know? anyway. So she, you know, she liked that it started liking the devotees, and the devotees started using her facilities, the washing machine, the kitchen, and everything up there. And then Srivananda said, yeah, we have a room for you. And there was an apartment of the lady upstairs. No? Yeah. Anyway, so I, I moved in there, and in the, big, in the, in the morning, at, when, we, when I woke up in the morning, I noticed that everyone was sleeping in the same room. No? But it was too late. No? <laughs> I had to accept it. Right? Anyway, and just almost a week after that, all of a sudden, devotee said, Power Bad Vienna, Power Bad Vienna. Yeah? Anyway, so the power was about, about to arrive. No, and when the day came, we went to the airport. At that time, we uh, had certain, how you say, uh, customs. You know, how is it called? Gebräuche, what was that? Gebräuche. What is that in English? No. Huh? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I'm not used to speaking English anymore. 
Huh? Habits. Habits, yes, yeah, certain habits. So, for example, we were convinced that to chant Hare Krishna you know, and sing and all that, live there, we had to have a good carpet also. No? So, when Pawan came, we took the carpet to the airport. You know, it was pretty heavy, three devotees carrying the big carpet. You know? So, when, when we arrived at the airport, we put the carpet in front of the house where the people would come out. And we put some incense there also, you know? and we're chanting. You know? And just like uh, uh, Vaidana mentioned that at that time the airports were different. You know, Hamburg had a very small airport. It was dark, like you said, you know? because it was very expensive to fly at that time. And all these, the, the people who flew normalmente were people with, how you say, officials, you know, with their briefcase and, and how you say, uh, Craft, uh, uh, tie, tie, suit, like that. It was dark. Anyway, so we chanted, and I went, uh, we, uh, we were accompanied by the Indian. And the Indian brought a rose, a long, how you say, long uh, steel, what is that? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So he uh, went, all of a sudden, Powerman appeared. You know? And it was so effulgent. And just somebody mentioned, you know, the power parts, uh, 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 I say, um, Lächeln, what is that in wow. name? Yeah, his smile was so incredible. It was like the sun illuminated the airport, at least for us. Anyway, so the Indian went and gave the flower to Sita Prabhupada, and Prabhupada smelled it, looked at us. You know? And we had paid obeisances where we sat down again on the, on the carpet. You know? And we just sat there looking at Prabhupada. And at one point, there was a devotee amongst us. He was Jai Govinda. Jai Govinda was one of these devotees that Prabhupada had sent to India to avoid his military service. Because at that time, uh, uh, America was in war in Vietnam. You know? And so many devotees actually went, left this United States, go to other places. So Prabhupada had sent him to India. And because he was an ex expert in printing, so Prabhupada uh, asked him to come to Hamburg. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so he had some more experience with Vaishnava etiquette. So he got up, mm -hmm. uh, ran to Prabhupada, made his dandava, touched his feet. You know? And then Prabhupada did something very nice. He inclined himself and how say, rubbed, you know? he rubbed his head. You know? Actually, I saw this two times in life. You know? Another time I was sitting, guarding the door of Shri Prabhupada in London, you know, in Bury Place. And there was an Indian, young Indian boy. He came. At that time, Prabhupada, the room of Shri Prabhupada in Bury Place, uh, didn't have any bathroom or anything. Had he always come out of the room and then go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So at one point, I was well, guarding the door, guarding the go door of Shri Prabhupada. Prabhupada came out, and this Indian boy came in, and very emotional, you know, uh, 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 made his obeisance to Sri Sri Prabhupada. And Prabhupada also went down. How do you say, streicheln? What does that mean? Uh, yeah, huh? No. <laughs> anyway, anyway, you understand, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So then, uh, uh, when Prabhupada was there, when, when we, well, and Jai Govinda took Prabhupada to the taxi, and we kept sitting there and, and looked at Prabhupada, you know, and we know, well, now we have to go back to the temple. We got the, uh, the, the carpet again, the big carpet, we carried it back and on, on the underground to the temple, and we arrived, you know, and somebody said, Prabhupada wants to see us. So we went, and we had rented a little place in, in, in an because we had no room, we rented a little a tiny apartment for Shri Prabhupada uh, in one, how you say, uh, high yeah, how is this in English? Yeah, Hochhaus, what is that? Yeah, yeah, anyway. You know, so we all went, you know, and uh, we got on the elevator, and when we opened the door of the elevator, we heard Prabhupada singing from far away. And also there was some kind of incense on the, on the pathway. Right? Huh? Because when, when, when you got in the room, <coughs> ah, I forgot something more or less important. Uh, when Prabhupada appeared before us at the airport, he was accompanied by um, uh, Purushottam. Purushottam. So Purushottam, uh, 
was not dressed in, in, in do devotional clothes. Um, but he, had a, he was shaved, he had tilak and sika, and he had a chain around his neck with a big juggernaut. Yeah? Of course, at that time in, in America, you know, juggernaut had become very popular amongst the devotees. Actually, this one of, was one of my first occupations in the temple. I started carving juggernauts and giving them to the devotees. Yeah? Anyway. So this is not not no not I say not a custom anymore. Anyway, so uh, we went up to Shri Prabhupada, and Prabhupada was sitting on the bed and playing harmonium and singing the old melody. Kiba Jaya Jaya Gora Chandra. No, this is the melody that Prabhupada used to sing. Now we now the melody is different. Anyway, so Prabhupada was sitting there. We got in there, you know, very I say close to each other because there was no room. And also Mandali Bhatra, who is another devotee that Prabhupada sent from Canada uh, to Germany. He was a German, and he's, when Prabhupada noticed that he sent him to Germany, he became our translator of the books later. Anyway, so Mandali Bhatra was translating because it was a little difficult to understand Prabhupada's English. No, because the English that we learned at school was not actually uh, sufficient. Uh, no. Anyway, so he, he translated, and after he finished, uh, the trans after Prabhupada stopped, uh, stopped speaking, Mandali Mada presented his mother. He said, Srila Prabhupada, this is my mother. You know? And Prabhupada said, yes, from a good mother comes a good son. You know? And the mother was <laughs> very impressed by Srila Prabhupada. No? Anyway, and after that, we used to go out on a morning walk to Srila Prabhupada. And at that time, this was in September 69, uh, so it was pretty cold at that time. So Prabhupada was dressed in a, in a, in a how you say, uh, a mantle. What is a mantle in English? Oh, oh. Huh? A coat, a black coat with a black hat. You know, these Russian hats that you can turn down like this, you know? Uh, anyway. So no, we, we were walking with Shida Power almost every day. Uh, and before Shida Power had come, the devotees had decided that all of us had to have a job to make money to pay the rent. Mm -hmm. So uh, during Power stay also. Mm -hmm. I remember Shivananda was working in the in the house uh, in some there was a big park in, in, in Hamburg. Huh? Yeah, botan botanical garden. No, I had taken a job somewhere in, the, in some reception of a big company. I had to sort out the mail and put it in the boxes and all that. Oh, later on, I worked in a place where they were selling toilets. You know. <laughs> anyway, and, and one devotee was also selling newspapers. You no, know, like that. Anyway, so when we walk in with Shri Power in the morning. Uh, one or the other, we had to dis we have to, uh, I say, uh, go to work. And then I remember uh, there was a, we passed the underground station, and I had to go in there and go to work. So then I prayed obeisances to Shri Prabhupada, and I, it was very extensive. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna. You know, when I got up, I was was couldn't see him anymore. But there were people around me looking. <laughs> anyway, so then, uh, and also, one day we had the, we had no 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 idea how to deal with power, but not even the devotees, the American devotees had come, no? had no experience in dealing with the power. But no, Shivananda no, learned to cook how from from Sri Prabhupada. He taught him how to make dal. No? And the old way, I don't know what they do now. They have these pressure pots and all that. So, anyway, so in that time, you know, when you made the doll, you put the chons in. You know, and you had to put the chons in. You, know, you fry the ghee, the, 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 how you say, the spices, open the top, and throw it in. And if you don't, even not fast enough to close the, the pot, then there was an explosion. You know, and it would go over. And that happened to Shivananda. In that apartment, he had no. There were all spots on the walls after that, and also, oh, when we when I came into Shri Power's room in the beginning, when we all went up, uh, Power was sitting on the on the bed and singing, and Pudushottam had changed his clothes into Dodi Kurta, and he was staying doing arti. 
No, because at that time, Prabhupada used to travel with small Radha Krishna deities. Uh, no, and his servant had also had always no, this service of worshiping the deities at the same time. And after Prabhupada left, no, the kitchen was all spotting, spotty. The, the, the place where the deities had been was all black, you know, because of all the, you know, from the flames or the incense or who knows what, like that. And we had to renovate the whole place, you know, <laughs> the whole apartment. Anyway, so one day we went to the harbor, Hamburg Hafen. No, we went down there, and uh, we came out very early in the morning. And it's uh, in Hamburg Harbor, I don't know, if, I haven't been there for many, many years, but at that time, there were a lot of workers coming from the docks. You know, those who were working on the ships, and they had also uh, made ships there. You know, they had these, I don't know how in English anymore. Anyway, huh? Yeah, shipyards and all that. And they had shifts. You know? They were working all night in shifts. You know? And they were always changing. The people were always changing. I remember, so when we got out of the, uh, got out of the uh, uh, underwear, okay, what am I saying here? Uh, 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 underground. Underground. Um, uh, no, all these dirty workers who were there, you know, kind of, wow, really weird. So... No, like I'm saying, we had, like I was saying, we had no experience with Shri but no, normally, uh, normally, uh, no, uh, later on, devotees would always uh, take power to very beautiful areas like parks and, and who knows, you know, like all that. But we had no experience, and we took into the harbor, you know. Anyway, so we walk, we walk on the on the side of the of the river. No, and uh, the port in Hamburg, no, I, I'm, in Hamburg is on the river. It's not on the side of the ocean. So, so when they when the ships are brought in there, no, and uh, I say you know, to the docks or whatever, no, there's a lot of small ships, who schlepper. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> so they so they, there was a big ship coming in. And the little tug, tug boats, right, yeah, tug boats were managing, you know, and the ship was com coming, I, I say, uh, um, I know in Spanish, al revés, what is it? Uh, <laughs> the other way around, you know, from the back first, it came the back first, how do you say? Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 and it was a power, oh, power what was, when power was about to sit on the bench, it was all wet. And so one of my godbrother Vasudev took his jacket off and put it on the bench that Prabhupada to sit. Now, wow, we were very impressed by his devotion. No? <laughs> so then Prabhupada was sitting there, no, with his cane and looking no, at the at the port, and he saw that ship, and he said, "This is just like Maya." No? I mean, the little tugboat like Maya. No, the ship is big enough to to how you say to maneuver itself. No? So anyway. So then also, on the way back from the harbor, something else happened. That uh, Prabhupada went us, with us on the, on the underground. No? And I noticed Prabhupada was, very, was always studying the, the publicities, also on the street. No? For example, he, he also, at one point, he said, oh, cigaretten. No? It's very popular, cigaretten. And so many bars, you know, also in Hamburg, no? anyway. Anyway, so when Powerpoint was riding on the underground with, with, her, with us, he was looking at the publicities, and at one point we had to get out. And Powerpoint had taken his head off and put it on the seat on, on the side. So we get, when he got off, we know, oh, the head is still in there, no? So we, you know, we jumped and held the door open, and somebody ran in, you know, get the head, and pow! You know? And the underground closed its door, so. And, Prabhupada was standing there observing the activities of his disciples, you know, like kind of studying. <laughs> anyway, so uh, then uh, I had just been, like, say, a week in the temple when Prabhupada came. And actually, the first day, well, going back, the first day, Purushottam told me, Prabhupada's uh, dictaphone is broken. Can you get him a, a, a how do you say, a, Tape, a tape recorder. Can you get him a tape recorder? 
And uh, yeah, and I knew my father had gotten a tape recorder. At that point, the tape recorders were not tiny like this or something. They were like pieces of furniture, you know? huge rows like that and everything. And I knew my father had gotten one. You know? And even though I, my, my, uh, my father didn't like very much I was, what I was doing, I said, got very angry at me that I didn't become a normal person anymore. No, they, my parents thought that, well, another craziness, Hare Krishna, I don't know. But a Yaseva, uh, uh, yeah, um, he will change again because he's always changing things. But I never changed. No? Anyway, so I went home and I convinced my father to give me the tape record. I couldn't believe it that he was ready to give it. So I carried it back to Shiddha Prabhupada. And when I arrived at Prabhupada's apartment, Purushadam said, yeah, you explain it to Shiddha Prabhupada how this works. So I went in and I explained everything, Prabhupada was patiently listening. And uh, later on, I heard he never used it. <laughs> anyway, so before leaving the room, I asked Shri Prabhupada, Shri Prabhupada, can I become your disciple? Huh? And Prabhupada moved his head like this. No, in India, when they say yes, they say, huh? anyway, a few days later, there was John Master me, uh, no, and, and Prabhupada, initiated five devotees. Actually, the day that, uh, one day before uh, Yasapur, what I was saying, John Master, Hari Griva came from America, and he was carrying the manuscript of the Krishna book. You know, he was Prabhupada's editor, because he was an English professor, actually. You know, he came, he was shaved with a long beard. You know? Anyway, so John Master, in the morning, Prabhupada, initiated us. We were five. He, Hari Griva had brought another Bhakta from America who was very eager to become an Ishiva Shana Prabhupada. And uh, my old friend Vasudeva, you know, he had been my friend, Kami friend before. We went through all these things of searching and this and that, experimenting. You know, anyway, we, so we had separated shortly before he went to the temple. Uh, you know, and when I came to the temple, I thought he was there too. You know? <laughs> anyway, so when I, then Prabhupada initiated us, and there was another, there was a couple. They were a little well, older than us, because we were very young at that time. Anyway, so they were practicing yoga, and they also wanted to become initiated. And Shri Prabhupada accepted them also. Anyway, so Prabhupada was making the ceremony. Uh, how you say the, executing the fire ceremony. And uh, he was sitting you know, on, the, on the cushion only, on the, on the floor, doing everything. You know, so that at one point, it was my turn to become initiated. So I, at that time, Prabhupada used to, not like nowadays, you know, the guru chants the japa before he comes to the ceremony. Or, no. At that time, you give the japa to Shri Prabhupada, he would chant the whole japa, and then he would uh, proceed. You know? And so at that time, I had not shaved my head yet. You know? I had long hair. And so Papa looked at me, you know? he looked at the devotees, like, you know, kind of, what, what's happening? Why didn't he shave? And then Papa said, oh, first I gave the japa to Papa, there was a knot in it. And I was eager to tie the, untie the knot. And Papa said, this is Maya. And then, uh, 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 um, when Prabhupada had chanted the japa, he said something very extraordinary. Actually, he said, there was a picture of Panchatattva on the wall. He said, you shave your head or you leave it like this, but don't touch it anymore. Right? No, not like, no kind of, no. Anyway, so for a long time I had, I had thought that this was my imagination, you know, that I, 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 I couldn't figure out why, you know, how is that possible? Prabhupada told me something like that. And then, at one year in Mayapur, we had a Prabhupada disciple reunion, many years back. And Shivananda also came you know, to the Mayapur festival. And at one point, it took us to go on, this, on, the, on the scene, how is it, on the, on the uh, anyway, stage, right? Uh, and uh, speak also about our experience with Shri Prabhupada. And so Shivananda started speaking first. And at one point he said, yes, when Prabhupada was making his initiation, 
perform initiation in Hamburg, he said that either one can leave, leave the hair long or shave. You know, I couldn't believe it. it was actually true what I have heard. You know, I was doubting about this long time. You know. Anyway, so Prabhupada you know, named me, at that time he named me Suchandra, and Prabhupada explained that Suchandra means you know, there's two uh, 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 most beautiful things in the world, the full moon and the, how you say, the light blue lotus. Uh, but Krishna you know, is Suchandra. He's more beautiful than the moon. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So then, uh, uh, um, while Power was in Hamburg, Shivananda also brought a professor, you know, uh, an Indo Indology professor to Sishra Power. And so when Power was speaking to the professor, uh, he was a young guy, and he, uh, uh, he had doubts. You know? For example, one doubt he had was, was that, uh, your disciples are all hippies. Huh? Obviously, he didn't like the hippies. And then, uh, you know, so Power took this very serious. You know? He wrote a letter to Brahmananda in New York you know? and told him, we have to change the image, start to change this image. You know? Because these people, like the professors, they don't take us serious because my followers are all hippies or ex hippies. You know, like that. Anyway, so. Then uh, in London, the devotees, the three couples, they had contacted the Beatles, you know, I'm especially Mukunda. And so he, they had made a record, George, and George Harrison had helped him to make the, uh, the Hare Krishna mantra hit. How do you say hit? Uh, yeah, hit. And this mantra became very, went up on all the hit parades all over Europe and I guess America also, you know, anyway. So they were pushing to the power, power, but come soon. We, 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 we have become very important. Our preaching is taken very seriously. You know? So he had to cut his wizard short. You know? So he, he left us. Oh, then one thing also regarding initiation. Next day was Vyasa Puja. Mm -hmm. So Shida Power was sitting on his uh, uh, Vyasa son. Mm -hmm. And we're making kirtan, isn't that? And then all of a sudden, we had to speak to Srila Prabhupada. At that time, nobody wrote down offerings, so there was no Vyasa Puja book and all that. But one had to speak to Srila Prabhupada. Yeah? And at one point, they also, no, I felt that also had to stand up in front of Srila Prabhupada. And I, sp I started to speak in German to Srila Prabhupada. Yeah? And Prabhupada looked at me. No? <laughs> anyway, so then after that, Prabhupada left us, and he went to London. Mm -hmm. And later on, we met Prabhupada you know, uh, uh, many years, uh, following years, I'll say. Yeah. No, I don't say. And uh, I, I saw Prabhupada in London always. You know? We went year after year, I went to London, except for 70, you know, 76, I was also there. No, 76, I didn't go, but 77, we went there. No. And whenever we went to London, at the same time, there was a Ratha Yatra. And normally, many devotees came from all over Europe to take part in the Ratha Yatras in London and to see Srila Prabhupada. No. At that time, the, the temple, the burial place, was a very small temple. No. It was so small. How small? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, small. So they, they had juggernauts and they had. Radha London Ishvara there also, <clears throat> on the same altar. You know? And Jagannath was above uh, Radha London Ishvara. You know, normally they, they share the altar on the, on the side, in a kind of, but they went one above the other because the room was so small. Anyway, so uh, uh, we took part in Ratha Yatra, and Prabhupada was present, except for one year. We went there, Prabhupada didn't come all of a sudden. Uh, anyway, so so then, in, in, and we also went on morning walks with Srila Prabhupada and Hyde Park and different places. And then uh, in 76, no, 77, uh, no, this was the last time Prabhupada came. He came in September. No, in 77, he came to London. At that point, I, I formed part of a group of devotees. We were preaching in the communist countries like in Poland, and, and, and I also went to Russia a few times. And anyway, so then uh, 
we, we, I was just in preaching. Was I remember the name of my of this devotee? He was American. We had we were just in Hungary, and every now and then we had to give reports to Harike. She was our GBC, and our preaching was top secret. We couldn't talk with anybody else about this. Only with Hari Kesh. You know, when we came back, and when first we started with wigs, you know, but then we felt it was ridiculous to have wigs. We just let our hair grow for this kind of preaching. Anyway, so um, at one point I called from Hungary. I called Hari Kesh, and Hari Kesh said, "Oh, but it's in London. Immediately go to London." So anyway, so we drove all the way from from Budapest. We drove to, drove to London. It was a pretty heavy driving. You know? Anyway, so before we left, the devotees in Hungary had given us some watermelons. You know? And uh, so you know, we were supposed to eat them, but we, we, somehow we had no time really to eat so much. And so we got to London. You know? And so when we arrived, I gave him, at that point when Prabhupada came, he didn't eat anymore. But still the devotees, uh, as far as I remember, they were cooking for power. They couldn't tolerate that power, but wouldn't be offered anything. Yeah. So I gave uh, watermelons to, to the cook. Mm. And then I went and I sat in front of the door. I remember there was a, the person who guarded the door, should have power, was, a, was from Israel. And uh, he was sitting there. Anyway, so I noticed that, that when, when the, the, the cook, the lady came with a plate, there was watermelons on it, no? Anyway, so then they put the plate, to give Power the plate, and when the plate came out, only Power had only eaten the watermelons. Hare Krishna. <laughs> anyway, so when we arrived in, Lon in London, I guess my godbrothers were also there at that time, no? and we saw Power, but for the first time it was a shock. Uh, we were shocked. No? Many devotees were crying. No? Uh, no, that was when in the morning, when uh, Prabhupada, they brought him down to the palanquin, you know, to the to the to the into the temple, and Prabhupada didn't sit anymore on the on the vyasa He just sat on the palanquin. You no, know, on his side there was uh, Tamal Krishna you know, sitting on his side. You know, at that time, uh, whenever there were problems, big problems in Iskon, Prabhupada always called Tamal Krishna you know? He was this, well, well, I say, uh, I don't, I don't know, say, right yeah, yeah, right hand like that. So he was sitting on his side, looking just at Shri Prabhupada, while Prabhupada is looking at the devotees who come from all over Europe, you know, and all the devotees were, you know, crying, seeing Prabhupada in that condition. He was very, very thin. His hands were swollen. His feet were also swollen. He was using uh, dark glasses, you know. And he didn't speak anymore. He was sitting there and looking at the devotees. You know, and the devotees were chanting the holy names uh, very sweetly, no heavy metal, like, like just an hour ago or something. <laughs> have it, have it. You know, very sweet. You know. Anyway, so I remember you know, every now and, now and then, the Tamar Krishna grabbed his, the lota he had prepared for Shri Power and put it in front of his mouth so Power would. How you say, spook? How you say that name? Spit. He would spit. No? Yeah, anyway. Uh, no. And then later on, no? so, and just like I said, we went there for Janmashtami also, and Guru uh, Vyasa Puja. No? We went there with Prabhupada. Anyway, so, uh, 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 and then all of a sudden, no? there was a problem with Sri Prabhupada. No, the most of us had no idea what was, was going on, really. No, and many of us learned the, what had happened at that moment from the diary of Tamar Krishnamars, the last lesson, I think. I don't remember the exact name. No, where he told, what he told us that at that point, Shri Prabhupada had to be taken to the hospital, and they had a little operation. How do you say operation? Because Prabhupada couldn't pass water. How is it in English? No, pass water. And when Prabhupada came back from that, I, I heard also that the doctor who, who did this treatment on Srila Prabhupada, you know, he became very impressed by Srila Prabhupada. He used, then he came also to the temple you know, to look after Srila Prabhupada like that. Anyway, so then when, Prabhupada, when this happened, 
Prabhupada decided that he had, didn't have much more time and he, was, he decided to return as soon as possible to Vrindavan, to his home. You know, Prabhupada used to say that Juhu, yeah, yeah, what I'm saying, uh, Bombay was his office, Mayapur was his uh, place of service, uh, and, uh, and Vrindavan was his home. So she had power and went back to, to uh, after a very short stay. Actually, the plan had been, you know, Pawan felt a little better in, in Vrindavan, and he decided to go to America, st have a stop over in London, and then continue for America. You know? And he said that his disciples still needed him, something like that. You know? Anyways, he only went to London, he became sick or very weak at that point, and they brought him back to Vrindavan. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so Prithu was also speaking about this list, yeah, that uh, uh, Harikesh had made a list of the senior devotees in Germany, that they go to Vrindavan and stay with Srila Prabhupada for some time. Yeah, I, remember, I still remember three names, uh, Manidara, so my, my name, and also Prithu. Yeah. And I was right after Prito. Yeah. But uh, when Prito was there, Prabhupada left us, so I didn't have the opportunity anymore to go to and say with Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, 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 there's many more things. <laughs> I don't know how much time I have here. What is that? Uh, huh? Finish? Oh. Thank you for listening for tolerating me, Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. So I got very much inspiration by hearing Prabhu Bhattibhushana Swami revealing so many pastimes, so much rare, you know, history and experience that he got a good fortune to uh, experience together with Srila Prabhupada and other devotees. And I'm very much uh, indebted to Prabhu, I mean uh, Maharaj, that, uh, you know, when I, when I just uh, came in the temple in uh, München, so I felt the uh, complete uh, friendship and uh, what is called uh, the, the real affection that I was missing for so long because, uh, you know, some or other was traveling, traveling all over. I went to, to one festival. There was a music, uh, material music, but some or other there was this also the, uh, the Maha Mantra, this Yamuna was singing in the, in the record. And the thousands and thousands of young hippies, they were hearing the Maha Mantra. And then, um, you know, I didn't know anything, it was in 1969. And then uh, some or other got some, uh, what is called uh, inspiration and some, and, and some joy within the heart about this chanting on the Maha Mantra. And before that, that was in the Isle of Wight, you know, in, the, in the September. Then before that, I, I saw in London, uh, Harinam group was, were singing, just like in a, one behind the other. And then uh, I was so surprised to see, but at, at, the, at that time probably it was not uh, enough, uh, you know, growing up the desire to go to them and ask what happened, what happened. And it was not, re it was not my time probably. And one friend, when I was going down to Italy, in Milan, he was telling that if you go to the Hare Krishna, you know, they're very friendly, then they're very clean, they give you something to eat, and then some or other I got the desire to, to be in touch with the devotee, but it was so uh, unmanifested, see? Then some or other I went to, to Munich again, I mean, after being traveling all over Europe, I went even to Istanbul all the way because I wanted to go to India. 
but I have only six dollars from Istanbul, so it was not enough <laughs> to to go even by 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 bus. No, it was not not even enough. So then I went back to Italy, and that devotee told me that that friend told me about you know the the, the devotees. So and I, I somehow rather Krishna arranged that I end up in Munich, where the the temple was there in Munich. But uh, it was not my intention to, it was not revealed at, at the moment about that I used to go there. So, and then uh, I saw the point, as I saw, was saying in, in Kroshnaskar when there was, when there was uh, Prabhupada as a puja, I was telling the same thing about, you know, I saw the devotee, then I asked him to bring me to the temple, to the, yeah, to the temple, exactly. But he was doing book distribution, magazine distribution. Those days was in '73 in Jan January probably, and then uh, he stopped the book dis this magazine distribution. He brought me first. He went to the shop to take some glasses and some specs, and then he brought me to the temple. And, I, and then immediately once I entered, I felt satisfied. And after that. You know, I went, we went together from Munich to Paris, and I saw for the first time Srila Prabhupada coming from the airport, and the devotee he gave one big garland to, to offer to Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada for, bow down, and then after that, he has a big smile, so it was the first time that I saw him, Prabhupada. And then uh, again, we went, uh, yeah, we went back, we, we were just traveling, and Prabhupada came again in, uh, I think it was 74 in Schloss Retesov. Then, yeah, in Schloss Retesov. Then there, there was Prabhupada in, in the middle, and the devotee were chanting round, round, and around him. It was uh, June, it was very nice weather. And then he gave the initiation to the devotee, you know, there in, the, in, in Schloss Retesov. I remember that before, we went to the in the Heidelberg where Prito Prabhu was in charge, and then uh, there was Radha Krishna there also, and then we I got the first initiation, and then the next time Sadhuta Prabhu was in the middle of this the square there was a big square in the in Heidelberg, and I got done on an initiation, and then uh, yeah we went all the way from Munich to. Uh, Stockholm and Prabhupada was there. Uh, as, as that's why we are celebrating this fortunate event of 50th anniversary of, you know, remembering of Prabhupada coming here in Stockholm, blessing the whole Scandinavia, <laughs> all the fortunate, you know, darshan, like in the university, and then, like Prito was telling about that person who was challenging Prabhupada that, uh, because he was speaking about the, the, the Barna Shram, but then Prabhupada was telling that I am, what, it was a challenge, what class you are, you, you think you are first class? And then he said, no, I am the fifth class because I'm serving all of them. And then Prito was giving the clear because he was sitting by, nearby, and then he saw directly Prabhupada the, the, the mood I was having to, to serve everyone. So this is the one time, then France, then in England, and then here in Stockholm, and then in Germany. So these are the, the, the memory that I didn't have any direct, oh, when I was, we were in the Schloss Rettis for the, the one point, uh, Prabhupada was giving a darshan, so we were all sitting around and I was just in front of Srila Prabhupada and then, you know, just listen and listen. I could, I could have, I could have, you know, go, because he was there in one week in Schloss Retesov, and I could go and, and just go and speak to him, but somehow or other it was too early for me to take this step, the initiative to, you know, have some direct uh, uh, question and listening to Prabhupada. There was not probably the time. So, 
Mm-hmm. And also my memory it was not a long. Uh, just we just went on distributing books and also. Uh, and then of the morning walk. Now one time I went to the morning walk in the in Pont in Germany, and this is how the, my little memory then I could recall because of the you know this it was so early in the beginning. I was seventy three, and that that's all I can say about Prabhupada. <laughs> what to do? I'm just grateful that this is uh, the chance to meet together here, because because of this uh, fortune, the Prabhupada came in, in in Stockholm, in in 50 years back, for this reason that we are all associating and exchanging and having so much inspiration and uh, good fortune that will carry us, inspire for the next. Uh, I think this is the this is this is the generation. The, this is the 50 year when we shall celebrate the 100 year will be a future generation because <laughs> it will be 2000 plus 23 plus 50 2073. So the next generation will celebrate the 100 year. When there is 100 year, what, what is called the golden jubilee. It is golden and now it's silver. Eh? Yes. It is. Eh? So this is the last chance that we are meeting here, f- the, the 50 years after, and then uh, we're very grateful to those devotees who are organizing this meeting together. You know, w- w- without this particular, uh, uh, you know, event, we will not be able to to meet all together in one place. No? We have to go this place, this place, to meet each God brother. But also thanks uh, Begavan Prabhu and Ajit Prabhu about inviting Prabhupada here to come to Stockholm. It was a very good, uh, it was a miracle that we could, you know, have the chance to see Prabhupada those days, in those 50 years back. And now we are just uh, remem- remembering this fortunate time that we were together with the God Brother and Prabhupada presence. That's all I can say. <laughs> Not so much continuation. Thank you very much for your presence. To t- all glory to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Jai. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Oh. So I. Well, first of all, I want to apologize. My, I'm still suffering from some kind of summer flu. So concentration could be a little bit better. But I'm okay. I feel very enlightened by all this nectar. And I'm happy that I didn't have to go and sleep in between. Now, uh, I'm coming back. Well, I'm still traveling. Uh, After a long time of of not extended traveling, I did like six weeks nonstop, practically all over, well, Czech Republic, Germany, and Belgium. So, I already, in all these places, I mean, I went to Carlo Vivari, Prague, and near Brno, the Navagokula farm in the Czech Republic. And, well, if you're a Brahma disciple, it's a bit, even if you want to stay in the background, it's impossible. This, you know, these young devotees, they want to hear everything, every detail, how you join Krishna consciousness, and first meeting with Srila Prabhupada, later experiences in Srila Prabhupada's presence. So what I meant to say, the last six weeks, practically non-stop, you know, I related the story many times, how I joined, how I came to Krishna consciousness, my first meeting with Srila Prabhupada at the Bhaktivedanta Manor, and then the adventurous overland trips with, you know, we went to India from Germany with the big buses and vans. 
lots of things happening, told those stories, and my personal association with Srila Prabhupada, I think the most intense was in India. But before I get into that, I just want to, you have to know, well, many of, many of you may not know me, but I, for many years, I kept my distance, let's say, from the institution. Because I had some, yeah, okay, disagreements. Put, and now my realization after traveling and being with devotees, going on Harinam after a long time, Maha Harinam actually, and you know, seeing, like for example, in Czech Republic, there was Bhakti Vikash Maharaj, who was an old friend of mine. We used to work together in Bangkok. And I know he has a bit of an image of being a very, how do you say, some people call him fanatic. Some people say he's a woman hater and he's a very uh, kind of too ascetic, whatever. But if you know Bhakti Vikash Maharaj, actually, he's a very jovial character. Lots of joking and everything. If you only know him from picture, well, he does look very stern and, you know, so I was very happy to meet him. We were joking, like in the old days. But what I wanted to say, like, the big experience in, uh, that was in Bruno, Navagokula Farm, I don't know anyone has been there. It's a, anyone has been there? Yeah. It's, it's a very austere place. There's virtually no electricity, except for some shed where they recharge batteries of the phones and whatever modern electronic device. So, and it's very austere, and it's also very beautiful. So we went, uh, just, I want to relate the stories how I, a lot of change in my mind and heart. And just give one example, Bhakti Raghava Maharaj, the sannyasi who walks on one leg with crutches. So I was astounded. He, it was a three hours Harinam uh, Sankirtan, and that Maharaj on his crutches, he sang and walked all the three hours nonstop. Whereas I, I had to sit down two times, just five minutes or something, but I was very impressed. So I thought with all my criticism, what did I do all these years? And another example was in Goloka Dam, Abenteuer, Germany, this Pujari lady, Damuna Priya, for at least for the last 20 years, she's doing that steady Pujari service. I heard now she's like a head Pujari for Germany, training others also, is that right? Yeah, the lady from Switzerland. Uh-huh. The lady from Switzerland. Yes, Priya. So I was more than impressed and, and being nothing less of being overwhelmed by the reception of the devotees everywhere, wherever I went. And so I just give you the small rundown. First I went to Amsterdam to meet an old friend, uh, Ananda Swarup Maharaj, who lives, well, not Maharaj anymore, but anyhow. So then I went to Goloka Dam also to visit my son and his family, but you know, those deities, Sri Sri Radhamadan Mohan, well, they are out of this world, and actually they are, but <laughs> I mean, so beautiful, just... And of course, there are a lot of memories that, I mean, the human brain works by association. So you remember how he came back from Sankirtan to Schloss Reitersof, your darshan, big kirtan, everything. 
And also funny things how Ikshaku started RT and then his dolly dropped off, <laughs> something like that. So he had to close the curtain and rearrange his dolly. So, but that's how the human, uh, that's how the human brain works. And from, so I went to Goloka Dam, just so you get the picture, back to my place. And then the devotee said, well, you're living near Leipzig, you might as well come to the Ratha Yatra. So I went, I met Jai Gora there, it was beautiful, I was asked to speak to the public, which I hadn't done, I don't know, for decades. You know, like in the old days, with microphone addressing the public, explaining in simple words what Krishna consciousness is, what the Maha Mantra is. So then they met a devotee from Singhachalam, who was taking care of Govinda Dasi, taking her around, who is Govinda Dasi, you know Govinda Dasi, I mean at least from hearing, one of the very early disciples. She wrote a book, I did the layout for her, so I kind of was involved. So this young devotee is from Jordan, Balaram Pran, said, well, I'm a video Prabhu, you're already here. Why don't you come to Singhachalam? So, <laughs> and before that, I was Czech Republic and everything. So I went to Singhachalam. And on the way from Leipzig to Singhachalam, he said, well, you're already traveling. So after this, we are going to Radadesh. So maybe you want to come. So, so I, <laughs> I said, give me two minutes. I have to think about it. So I agreed, and then well, after a few days we started, and we meant to stop only like 15 minutes in Goloka Dam to have darshan, and probably take some prasadam for on the way, something packed. And it was funny, because I had just been there, and people, oh, you're back already. You said next year maybe or something. How long are you staying? I said 15 minutes. Oh, so uh, we had to stay longer because Govinda Dasi became very sick. So we went on to next day to Radadash, then back to Singhachalam. Then I was two days at base and then I flew here. So that's so you just get the idea. So maybe my flu is also a bit of an ex exhaustion. So I. Well, well we, only, we don't only have limited time, so maybe, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not funny, but it's remarkable that the extreme experiences, they seem to stick to memory much better and in all detail than, yeah, other memories. So in Hyderabad, there was such an extreme uh, experience with Srila Prabhupada. <coughs> now I know I told the story in the last few weeks about three, four times, but I think it's worth to mention it again. And well, those devotees who have been with Srila Prabhupada in India, it was like special and one step further special. Of course, there was no, Hari Sori Prabhu, he explained it in those words that, of course, there's no, there, there's no Western Brahapad and no Indian Brahapad, and yet, in India, it was different. It was like home ground for Srila Prabhupada, and also how the Indian people and Bhaktas would relate to Srila Prabhupada was like more informal. So you got a lot, I mean, I could mention quite a few details, but one example is, was that when we went on a morning walk, Hyderabad farm, it was a small group. I mean, there were quite a few devotees there 
but on the morning walk sometimes five, six devotees and walk with Prabhupada, stop. And like for example, there was an Indian Sabjiwala with a big basket on his head. And Prabhupada started, how you call it, haggling with them about the price. What if he buy the whole thing? And he said, this and this much. Then Prabhupada said, no, too much. How the spiritual master, you know, like on a market deal, you know, totally Indian, so to say. In the end, the Sabjiwala didn't agree. But it was also, Rimati was there actually much more than I present because, well, everyone knows, just because Srila Prabhupada came to a place, it didn't mean that we all hang around all day. Like in Germany, every, we sent the devotees out to Sankatan. It was my job at that time to organize the groups of all these devotees. And in Hyderabad Farm, Rimati was fortunate enough to be all the time there. In Srila Prabhupada's present, and I went out with Shankar Britt on life membership during the day. So many things I only heard from Rimati or other devotees what happened that day. But in any case, it was very, Prabhupada was sitting right in front of everyone taking his mas massage and it was, yeah, like a big family. Huh? Very intimate. Okay, I said the word family, so I'm going to digress again. One of my favorite things, digressing. When I mentioned my realization about these travels in Europe, with all my criticism before, one thing I realized, we are actually a huge family. So, in a family, everyone knows, we do have some favorite brother, sister, we do have some favorite uncles, whatever. And we may not agree on each and every point with everyone. It's a family, after all. So that, that was my main realization. And another realization was, small one, that things have become very international. Like if somebody tells me, there's a new devotee in Germany, New German devotee, German devotee, can only mean two things. Either he or she is from Croatia or from the Ukraine. But sometimes also there are some... Russian. Russian. Yeah, Russian. And they do have new ethnic German devotees too. So, uh, so I think I stopped digressing here. So back to Hyderabad farm. So I mentioned there was this very extreme, and for that you have to know that Srila Prabhupada was... Uh, Vaidyanath already spoke about when Srila Prabhupada got angry. So that was quite extreme, because Srila Prabhupada was downright disgusted with the situation there, downright disgusted with the situation there in Hyderabad. The management, well, it was new. We only had received the place. Mahamsa Swami was in charge of the, you know, running the temple, expanding it. We had just arrived on the buses. But Prabhupada, being disgusted with the you know, management of Hyderabad Farm was only one thing. Some or other, he was also quite disgusted with his Western disciples, still, after so many years, lacking in the basic things like uh, cleanliness. Cleanliness. Yeah, cleanliness. So, it was intense. Rimachi just went. Yeah. Can I, uh, just oh, you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, uh, Srila Prabhupada came uh, from his morning walk, or uh, 
his rounds, whatever. And uh, he saw, and it was, we had a tree, there was a people tree, and uh, it's kind of a banyan tree. And um, that's where we would have, there was no temple. So that's where we would have Guru Puja under the tree. And it was a, like a platform. We also used to eat prasadam under that tree. So, <clears throat> so Srila Prabhupada came and sat on the Vyasa sun, which was very, very simple, uh, Vyasa sun. So, and he saw uh, there was some kitri stains on, on, on the ground. He said, how we can have Guru Puja here? Uh, they, you know, it, 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 clean this up, you know. And uh, so everybody got there, you know, stick brooms and the water from the pump. I mean, there wasn't actually a pump. There was just a, a well with a bucket. You throw it down and you pull it up and you bring the water. And then so there was, there were the bodies were like cleaning up. And then so there was one devotee. I won't uh, mention the name. He was uh, pulled out with his pocket Pachita knife. Pavana. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I it should. It was. It was the. <laughs> Maybe I should tell the story. Yeah, I was right at, there. At that particular one, okay. I remember a little better. It was we were getting ready for the uh, Guru Puja, Guru, Guru Vandana song, and Guru Puja. And Sri Ramavat came early, and you know, like Marimati described, they have these concrete platforms under the tree, and this was a longish one. And there were not only stains, there were leaf plates, and they were like crusted, caked. Yeah. Prasad. Nobody cleaned the, the, yeah, the night prasad. before. So Prabhupada <laughs> was so disgusted, and he virtually exploded. I mean, it was like, I imagine to be in the presence of the Shringer day or something, you know. He virtually exploded and he got very angry about our lack of, you know, even, how do you say, courtesy, the spiritual masters coming, but to speak about cleanliness in general. So Patita Pavana, he pulled out his pocket knife and he started scratching some of the spots. <laughs> Prabhupada said, oh. what are you doing? Um, trying to clean a little bit, Sri Prabhupada. With your knife? Yes, Sri Prabhupada. Okay, keep it for your throat. So <laughs> that's, that's what actually happened. So, uh, throat. So, oh, so, use it on your throat. Keep it on your throat. There are two versions, according to Patit himself, Patita Pavana. But that wasn't all that morning. No, he was just, he was, Hansa he was, Duda was just going to start Guru Vandana, mm -hmm. but it was a windy day, and you know, Indian, what they call go downs, these storage areas, well, we were all living in one of these storage boxes, uh, including Sri Prabhupada for the first few days, I remember. So they were just getting ready after cleaning, yeah, you were right, after that there was a cleaning session, and just Hansudo already uh, had it on his tongue to start. The wind blew open one of these doors right in the vision, line of vision of Srila Prabhupada, and one devotee bundle fell out. <laughs> I mean, a devotee, but it looked like a bundle. Punya Shloka from England. So Prabhupada said, What is this? <laughs> and. <laughs> no, but he no more. He, he knew there was somebody sleeping before the, the door blew open. He, he said, who is sleeping behind that door? Oh, really? yeah. And he said, bring him over here. Yeah. And then he, uh, he chastised him. He said, Sri Prabhupada, I'm sick. And Sri Prabhupada said, you're too sick to greet your spiritual master. I remember that. So. What did he say? He said, you can never be too sick to worship your spiritual master. Yeah. So. And the night before, just you get the mood of that. Uh, the night before, uh, there was invitation to the so-called Sunday feast, Hyderabad Farm Sunday, for the villagers. So 
Mahamsa Swami had the sweeper cook the feast. So, what, it, what they didn't expect, that Prabhupada, he would just sometimes walk out of his room and he saw the plate and he said, I want to try this. Yes, Sri Prabhupada. So Prabhupada took it, spit it out or threw it out, and before he could explode again, there was a scene that a dog, village dog came, sniffed at the food and didn't take it. So, so, so Prabhupada said, see, even the dog won't touch that. So the dog had taken, you know, the very, very illustrative so Prabhupada didn't have to explode again because it was so illustrated, plain for all to see. And Prabhupada said, you have to cook prasadam yourself. And in fact, Prabhupada always said, everything should be done by devotees, cleaning, <coughs> uh, especially cooking and everything. And, he's, and he said, don't think that the Indian guests from the villages will come for your singing. They have their cinema songs and they like them better anyhow. So at least we must give them very, very excellent prasadam. Uh, so it was very, very instructive and as we all know, the spiritual master is hard, can be hard like a thunderbolt and soft like a flower. Sure enough, during the days, I mean, Rimati can yeah, tell the story I, yeah. how Raghunath, he was always <laughs> whining and crying and... Uh, he was hungry. Yeah, hungry. And how then Raghunath came to show him all his toys, so maybe you want to relate that? Yeah, I... I um, um, actually, about the Pushara, Manshila Prabhupada threw that, he said, this is hot enough to kill you. There was so much chili in the, in the food. Anyways, in the morning, I used to go to uh, get milk from the 108 cows, you know, a little bit, and they had a kerosene stove, so it took a long time. So my son used to cry because he wanted his bottle of milk, and uh, so he, we all stayed, I mean, I stayed next to Srila Prabhupada's room, it's just a little farmhouse, three rooms. There was the bathroom, and there was in the middle, there was the um, Srila Prabhupada, and on the other side, there was, uh, there was my room. So um, we came around, and uh, he was crying, and suddenly Srila Prabhupada, came, there was these swing doors. Srila Prabhupada came, like, Shinga Dev came right out. He said, and he, he had his shave, shaving cream in his face and he holding his lota and, and his razor, you know, in this hand. And, and he was like, why is your son always crying 24 hours a day? Why can't you take care of him? You know, he's like raising his hand with his razor in his hand. And uh, so I, I felt like disappearing in the ground, you know. And, but my son stopped crying. And uh, so later on, Srila Prabhupada got his massage and stuff, and then he just sat on, on, in the sun to get, you know, warm. And so then my son, Raghunath, he, he got a flower, he gave it to Srila Prabhupada. So Srila Prabhupada took it. And then he, he had, uh, you remember, you, uh, Atma Vidya used to print the German books, so he had all the proof uh, like the pictures and stuff. So from those pictures, we cut them, and I made a little book for Ragunat. Oh. And with contact paper, you know, it was a little book, and uh, with all the Krishna pictures. So then uh, he got the book. He wanted to, you know, Show it. make up with Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. So he went to Srila Prabhupada, he handed it to him. At that point, you know, he, uh, Srila Prabhupada rubbed the boy's head and he took his arm around the boy and together they looked at the pictures, oh. you know, and he goes, oh, who's this, you know, and he, oh, it's Yasoda, you know, who's this, oh, that's Krishna, yeah. you know, 
And then I, I was standing you know, on the veranda, and he was like sitting here, not very far away. So, um, and then Srila Prabhupada looked at me, and he said, just see now, you, your son tries to make friends with me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Harakishna, time is over. Any questions? Any comments? Nice and you're back. Ah, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. I don't know if they still have it or not. Yeah? Yeah, they have it. But it's not the exception. Yeah. Actually, I'm missing Hyderabad quite a bit. Also, the city temple was very nice. Yeah, he slept on, slept on Brahma's yasa center. But she found the There are some t a new things I learned on the Bruno Farm by the presentation of Bhakti Raghava Swami. He has a collection of Srila Prabhupada quotes in regard to children, which was actually compiled by one, I think, Kunti Devi, some Mataji. And what struck me was that Prabhupada said, if a child is crying, don't let him sit and cry, pick the child up immediately. Another one was when the child comes into the kitchen, and just want some food, immediately give, them, give the child the food and know, oh, it's not offered and, you know, like, like you told Raghunath in, I think, in Bonn or something. Yeah, he took something and you said, it's not offered. But he's a, he was a smart boy. He said, well, you told me Krishna's in the heart. So if I put it here, it goes down. Krishna can take whatever he likes. <laughs> OK, thanks for having me. And nice to be here after 50 years. Good. So I'll see you in 50 years. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, I would like to ask Arista Hapabu to say a few closing words. Brother Palaka, he asked me if I could just... Uh, because I, I, I've been stay, living in the temple here for 20 years, serving Panchatattva, Srila Prabhupada, and uh, can, I can do representing the devotees here in Landvik School and also the deities. So we are all very grateful that you came and uh, shared your memories and expressed your love and devotion for Srila Prabhupada. It was a wonderful experience to hear you and also participate in the festival, the Mastami Vyasa Puja. I think all the devotees are very happy, grateful, and purified by your association. And uh, I, I don't have so many memories of Srila Prabhupada myself. I, I was going to university in Uppsala, and I was feeling very down like that in the but then uh, I just, one day I was going to the, by bicycle, going to the university to, to, <coughs> to, hear, to attend the school. And then 
in the window, I saw like one book, one open book in the window, and it was Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, like open, with the pictures there. And then, I, I don't know, I never heard about Srila Iskon or Prabhupada before that. It was uh, complete, but I, I felt within my heart that calling or that attraction to Krishna, to the book. I bought the book, and then I, in my room, I put up a picture of Krishna and Prabhupada on the wall, and I was trying to read the book. And then just a few weeks, I don't know how many, how long time, but a couple of weeks, Prabhupada came, I saw the poster in university, and then uh, I had a desire for the spiritual direction, for guidance, for the guru. And uh, there were so many other things going on in Sweden at that time, uh, transcendental meditation and different Christian groups. But then uh, Prabhupada came and I went to the lecture I remember that uh, Vegavan Prabhu, he was standing outside with a book table, outside the room, auditorium where Prabhupada was speaking. And uh, I was outside, many of us were distributing books on the streets before Prabhupada's lectures. And I, I went there and I was taking seat, like when I say like Prit and Maharaj, that distance to Prabhupada. <laughs> and I was I couldn't understand his accent or uh, what he said, but uh, I felt that attraction. There was this famous lecture about Vanasham Dharma. And uh, then I, I wrote a letter to, to the temple in Vegavan, who was a secretary, Ajit was a temple president. I received what the, I wrote to and Vegavan answer. And then uh, he said, it is not so easy, like, uh, like mentally and physically, this spiritual life, living like a devotee. But uh, I was so depressed and unhappy in the way I was living at that time. So anyway, I moved into the temple. And that was uh, maybe one month after Prabhupada came. And there were so many people coming to, to hear the class, the lecture, but I think I was the only one who took that step to surrender. <laughs> I also, I remember that in uh, 76, I saw Prabhupada in Vrindavan, and Mayapur in Vrindavan. I, I remember when he came back from the morning walk in Mayapur and taking darshan or Radhamadava, not the big deities, but the small ones. And uh, once I made Dandavats and Prabhupada was there, I touched his lotus feet. The devotees around him, the sannyasis, didn't look very happy because Prabhupada didn't want that, um, like devotees or touch his feet, but uh, it was a very soft and cool sensation to touch Prabhupada's feet. I also went to his room to take darshan in Mayapur. He was like speaking to the devotees and the same in Vrindavan. So, like a little memory like that. But so uh, we, are, we are so happy that you came for this celebration, and uh, I, and I, I wish that you would come back again, because to have like uh, yes, okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.